morning, everybody out there around the world, I hope. It's a beautiful day here in Maine. We don't have any snow or any indications of snow in our weather report. And I imagine it's the same way in New Hampshire, which is next to us. But uh, I'll tell you one thing, it's very difficult to get from Maine to New Hampshire. You can't get there from here, right, Jane? <laughs> I well, saw it. Yeah, it's, sometimes our roads don't uh, point the exact way we want them to point. But yes, it's a nice day here too, and I'm I can't wait for spring. <laughs> well, me neither. Uh, there, the buds are coming out, and the birds are chirping, and things like that. But uh, it's really good to talk to you, Jane. And I want everybody to know how lucky we are to have you on board with us today. Uh, it's rather unusual to get a real a life, uh, still alive uh, public school teacher, traditional one, uh, who's uh, willing, you know, to explain what's going on in her career and, or his career. Uh, let me give you a little background on Jane. Uh, she's from Bedford, New Hampshire, and she started teaching in 1970. She was barely 21 at that time. And she's, uh, which really fascinates me because I, I I wish that it wasn't so hard to get from here to there because I wish she'd come over here and uh, give me some art lessons since she is a self-taught oil on canvas artist. Uh, and as she said to me, it was only natural that she would become an art supervisor for grades K through 12, a job which she held for 10 years. Uh, lucky children, huh? She also worked in grades one and two classrooms for the next 23 years or so. That's a pretty fantastic record. During one of the school reform initiatives of the 1990s, Jane Aiken and her colleagues lost their lifetime job tenure. In order to continue with their contracts, the teachers had to attend many teacher training sessions in order to become recertified. As she says, the courses were nothing but lessons in, guess what? Academics, folks? Joke. Social engineering. She chose computer courses whenever she could because it seemed a way to accumulate some actual useful information. Aitken then became IT, that's instructional technology, I believe, or I don't know exactly what that is, but my son uses that word with me all the time, certified with a specialization in graphic design. She also fixes hardware, assists others with a purchase and setup of various devices, and tutors them on usage. Today, she uses her talents as an activist to support many causes, not the least of which is taking back the educational system from the corporations and non-governmental organizations and those who misuse our schools for political agendas. And there are plenty of them around, unfortunately, and they're all making lots of money. She was for six years Ed Naley's, I hope that's the correct pronunciation, sidekick on CNHT's Taxpayer Radio, which was heard on WLMW 90.7 FM, Manchester, New Hampshire. That's very interesting. I, that was before I knew Jane. She is one of the lecturers on the new 8-DVD set, Exposing the Global Road to Ruin, which uh, all of you, or maybe a few of you, uh, don't know, is now uh, a free download if you go on the internet and Type that in, exposing the global road to ruin through education. You can view that. You don't uh, be nice to have the set. You can buy the set at Amazon.com, but pretty good to take a look at the uh, the uploaded YouTube version of that, which gives 18 hours of videotaped presentations plus uh, one disc. The last one is uh, uh, written submissions from. Some, some marvelous researchers who are no longer with us, but gives you an incredible picture of uh, the planning that took place to bring us to the very serious situation we are right now, losing our public schools to the corporations and to global government. Uh, please go there uh, and also buy it at Amazon.com. 
so Jane, I'm going to let you run now with uh, what you've got to tell us today. And I'm sure it'll be very okay. interesting. And as I try to not interrupt you too often, but. Uh, oh, that's fine. Um, I first want to congratulate you on the uh, bumper music because you also probably don't know I was raised on that music. My dad is a was a jazz musician. He started with the big bands in the 1940s. And in fact, he made the very first music videos uh, at Radio City Music Hall, uh, which are on YouTube now. Uh, I think he was 17 years old. And those videos were supposed to go in those machines that were jukeboxes with screens. But because television was invented, they did not go into production with the jukeboxes with screens, but you will see different um, singers inside of the box singing, and I'm sure <laughs> anybody my age or older will remember that. Uh, they even used to play it on the American Movie Classics channel when that channel first it came on. But I remember as a child watching it on television, and um, so I was weaned on that music. Um, I don't play that type of music myself because I also play instruments, but I do love it very much, and it just made me feel all warm and fuzzy when I heard that bumper music. Well, so I, I know. I, I absolutely adore uh, Brubeck, and I and I like his music so much that I make mistakes occasionally, and I, I order uh, sets of his work <laughs> that I've already ordered. Or I, my husband was a musician, and uh, also a sailor, a musician, an artist and all. And he had this incredible collection of this wonderful, wonderful jazz, the history of jazz, everything. And and um, I am really addicted to it. And I, I'm just so pleased that we do have uh, subjects. I think we have to, we researchers, we have to, uh, you know, take a little vacation from what we're doing and have areas in our lives that, are really interesting, and, and I, I just tell the world that mine is jazz and uh, tennis. I am addicted mm. to watching uh, the tennis channel. <laughs> but let's, you know, we're avoiding, aren't we? We're avoiding talking about the subject that we spend 90% of our lives dealing with, uh, okay. education, well, and I, our, our I hopes for the children. In, but I do uh, wear many, many hats, and one of them is I work to help Others who are researching and fighting what's going on in the education uh, system in the public schools. And when people say that we want to destroy the public schools, they're very wrong because we want to preserve them. Right. But they're not, they're not what they're supposed to be. And as you said in my little blurb, I started teaching when I was barely 21 and I lasted 33 years. But I did see strange things happening in education right from 1970. And I finally connected the dots, and I, and I saw uh, that it was political. And as I said to you before, I thought I was being inducted into a cult because of the way we teachers were being treated. And I wondered where these crazy political ideas were coming from. But I saw the influence coming right down from the behemoth that is known as the United Nations and how it influences our federal government with everything now, and that what we're doing in the classroom is far more serious and far more um, insidious and something that is intentional uh, than just political correctness. Um, coming from me, I do feel that the federal intrusion into education is unconstitutional. Of right. course, we're doing a lot of things these days that are not constitutional. So, therefore, I think it's illegal. Uh, they always get around it by saying they have no authority or, for example, Common Core is optional. But somehow, they always manage some sort of punishment against the school systems or punishment against the teachers who won't do it, um, like losing federal funds, which, of course, is our tax money to begin with. So this business of it being optional is 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 quite upsetting because that's just a smokescreen. I, I believe that there are ways they enforce it, and nobody knows that better than I do from my experiences of being targeted uh, after being considered a good teacher all those years. 
I mean, I had children that come back to me now as adults and tell me they loved my art class. It really opened up a whole new world for them. Um, I had children's children, and then when it was time to have children's children's children, I decided it was time to retire. But mostly it was because they were really bearing down on you if you were fighting all of this, and it was very difficult to deal with. So once I became aware that what was happening in my work had political implications, I just became very active with that and with all the other groups that I uh, am active with. And um, then I've devoted my free time to, uh, as you say, all the activism that we do day in and day out that can get pretty exhausting. But it's a job. Someone has to do it. (laughs) And when I was on your DVDs, I, I really felt sometimes very silly talking about some of these things because they're outlandish. But it's true. They happened. And maybe my perspective was different because I didn't like what the end game was, but that is as they were. And that's why I was so appalled. Um, Well, Jane, let let me ask you something. Uh, Let me ask you something here, because you did do, I thought, a marvelous job uh, on the disc set exposing Global Road to Ruin through education. Uh, Tell me, do you have any idea how many, what sort of percentage, I know we keep losing, we keep getting lower and lower, but of teachers now uh, who understand what you understand uh, in regard to the uh, long time, the origins of uh, the present uh, education system, which is geared towards uh, really globalism, a total brainwash uh, in uh, the need to for the United States to give up its sovereignty. That's really it, and move into a world system, regardless of what they want to call it. Um, how? What percentage? I mean, I I try to feel, I try to be optimistic about this. Um, I have a, a niece who was a marvelous teacher for years, and uh, she lost her job two years ago because she was so good uh, in first grade teacher and marvelous reading program. She took all the children, you know, the children, inner city school of Rochester, New York. And the children, they, she and her husband would take them on camping trips in the summer and, and all this stuff. And she um, never really saw the entire picture until recently. So she really sees it now. And uh, she never really quite understood where I was coming from. And I'm, I ask myself, um, is there an awakening amongst the few that are left who are going to be fired or gotten rid of because they're teaching academics. What kind of an awakening? Is there any hope that we can get through to these teachers? Well, you know, I don't think a big percentage has the background on it as we do. I think they look at it as the bureaucracy is getting in the way of their teaching. And so we certainly try to educate them. And more and more are waking up to realizing that there's an agenda And um, the younger ones are coming in brainwashed from their own education, and they just want a job, so they go along with it. And this is what the schools want. They would rather get rid of good teachers like your niece and myself who are, you know, making decent wages after so many years and get the ones that are just starting out because the wages are lower, but they will do what they're told. And I do believe that at one point, when we were in a training session and I said to my colleagues who were all very good teachers, very good people, uh, they were in there to do the job for the right reasons. Um, They kept asking why we were doing these things and I said, well, do you know what it means when they keep telling you to justify your lesson globally? And one of them said, gee, I thought it meant, you know, with trade. And I said, no, we trade with other countries, but this is Globally, you have to, uh, this is basically, and it sounded shocking, but I said it's basically, (laughs) they want to overthrow the republic, uh, the constitution, they want to have a planned society of the future. And the minds just dropped open. I said, you know, we're we're supporting the overthrow of the government by what we're doing. And, And I really do think some of my principals and vice principals realize this, because they, too, had been teachers, 
And they knew what we were doing, and they knew what they were doing was wrong. And they finally realized it. I even said to my principal, I said, why are you supporting this communism? It's communism. Yeah. And when you talked like that at first, you became targeted because they would look at you like a crackpot or that you were being uncooperative. Jane, Jane, let let me, uh, before, because this is a good time to bring this up. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but... uh, just recently, I, I remembered in 1981, this is a little story, when I was in the Department of Education, uh, I made a friend there who was the wife of the head of the National Council for Social Studies. And uh, we became friends. And I had dinner with her one night in her apartment. And her husband wasn't there. And we started talking about the global education. And uh, she said that, her husband was sort of on board with all this, but she had the same concerns that I had. She was a career her career officer in the U.S. Department of Ed. And uh, she, and I said, well, you know, we all, uh, I'm an old foreign service girl, and I love the rest of the world, and I believe in teaching about other countries and their, their cultures and all this and that. There's a tremendous lack of understanding in the United States about these things, but not what we're looking at. And she said, that's right, Charlotte. She said, it it has very little to do with what you want it to be. And then she told me a really interesting story uh, about a party that she had been at, uh, which was the National Council for Social Studies, uh, guys and gals. And uh, Lee Anderson, who was a very prominent uh, change agent and uh, very involved with the Good Lad study, which is... uh, People can Google that, the Good Lad study, and four books that came out from that, funded by my office, Schooling for a Global Age, Communities and Their Schools, Arts in the School, and John Goodlad's A Place Called School. But Anderson was involved in Schooling for a Global Age and the Community School one. And uh, she said that at this party, uh, he came out of the closet. They'd all had a bit to drink, I guess. They're having good time. And he said, okay, folks, I'm coming out of the closet. Um, I am a card-carrying communist. So I'm telling mm-hmm. people that because Jane just mentioned that. And uh, people don't like to hear that. And no, they if don't. we ever mention that C word, you know, they get very upset and pull back and want to call it everything else like communitarianism or or whatever. They've got, you know, communism, all, every other word you can think of, but communism. Well, so go ahead, Jane, Jane, please. Yes, I used to I used to say these these C words that they throw at us that they want us to concentrate on. I think it was uh, collaboration, uh, collectivism, cooperation, consensus. And then I would say communism, because Good that's girl. what it's leading yep. to. It's not about the individual child learning skills for themselves, but how they were, were going to be the cog in the wheel of the planned society. And I know you agree with me on that. Yep. And if teachers are finding this out, I don't know how we're going to keep teachers who honestly go to, go to the job thinking they're going to teach skills And then they end up teaching, you know, redistribution of the wealth and those sorts of things. Um, And then I also have a problem with parents or taxpayers who are not parents and say, well, I don't have a dog in this fight. And I say, whoa, wait a minute. You absolutely have a dog in this fight because everyone, not just those, and what I'm going to say now is very important, not just those with children in the schools, should be concerned about how we approach education in the United States because it's been used to fundamentally transform society as we have been describing. And you turn me on to a very good book that explains how the Fabian socialists uh, group themselves up in the universities. Uh, I think it's a, an antique book called Turning of the Tides. I have a copy of it. And it was how they intended to change our country from the constitutional republic with capitalism to a top-down, centrally managed, regional, planned economy, redistributionist society of the future. And the methods that teachers are being told and taught and required to use reflect this philosophy. And it's more geared, that's why you see it, more geared towards social engineering 
and very child-centered and very lackadaisical when it comes to skills. I mean, you have a lot of self-directed group work, as I said, consensus building, process versus product. There are no grades anymore. Uh, the teacher is just a guide. You're not to give them any knowledge or guidance. It's very child-centered and almost into child worship where they won't discipline. Um, these philosophies are what is leading the way, and that is the reason why. And that's the big connecting idea that's proof of what they're doing. And, of course, we have the modern text being used in order to infuse the political agendas. Uh, teachers are told, you know, uh, if you've been studying the Common Core issue, they're told they can manage their classrooms any way they want, but that is not true. I have had people come in my room and spy on me and, you know, pull things out of my closets and ask me why I wasn't doing, you know, X, Y, and Z. There is no academic freedom anymore. Um, they really have no, absolutely no say over the methods they can use. I mean, you can go to a workshop in one year uh, doing something one way is uh, exactly considered a best practice, and the following year it's verboten. You know, this is bad. Now you have to throw that away. And frankly, teaching is not an exact science. It's an art. And, you know, you and the classroom teacher next to you might have two different ways of doing things, but you do it the best way you can to get it across to the children, and it doesn't matter. It's, it's an art. It's the way you do it, and the way she does it might be different but you have the same goal. These people feel that there's one way only, and if you don't do it, you're a bad teacher, you're subversive, you know, and uh, I can't tell you how many times I got in trouble <laughs> for sticking with the methods the kids liked and that I thought taught them what they needed to know and had no political agendas attached to it. Um, Jane, but this Jane. You know what, when you, you just said something so important, I don't even know if you realize how important it was, uh, that you know, you were talking about art and music and, and teaching, true teaching, you know, and, and help giving, giving to the child the knowledge the child needs to make his own decisions or upward mobility and all. And education has been changed. It's, a, it's known as a science now, scientific. Mm -hmm. And you're correct. And I don't know how many people realize that the head of the National Institute of Education, which was the key uh, office in the world, uh, the Office of Educational Research and Improvement, but NIE, uh, the head of it, who had been the um, headmaster at the Cathedral School for Girls in Washington, he was a Reagan supporter, uh, he was named the director. And when he got in there, and he found the four the books that I just mentioned to you, Schooling for a Global Age and all that, uh, he he resigned. Well, he wrote the president and called for his own office to be abolished. In other words, he was calling for getting rid of his own good job. Uh, and uh, the, the president allowed him to be fired by the secretary of education, T.H. Bell. And in an article, a very short little it's in it's in the deliberate dumbing down of America and Edu Education Week interviewed him. And he was quite brief about uh, why he was so upset, but he said exactly what you sort of said. Education is not a science. And in that, what he's talking about is uh, the data collection, uh, planning, programming, budgeting, management systems, the Skinner method, which is absolutely necessary for measurement, which is the workforce training. So, uh, this is really so important that teachers understand what you're talking about. Uh, that's probably the key. This is the one thing he said. It's not a science, and all of these people in the business community and the educational change agents, et cetera, the universities believe and are, are producing in-service training and all, which has nothing to do with true education. It has to do with total quality management, planning, programming, we have Skinner, globalism, and making money for the corporations to spin off profits, right? Using your children to spin off profits for the corporations. It's a science. And 
it's not meant to be a science and uh, you go ahead with that. But I'm glad you mentioned it because you have you have that great educator right on your side who got fired. <laughs> well, you know, the educators are afraid to speak out these days. The teacher is the lowest person on the totem pole. So when the public gets angry, you know, the conservative uh, party line is it's the teacher's fault. It is not the teacher's fault. The teacher is the victim. Even the unions have very little to say about curriculum. And I'm not a fan of unions in general, but they did come to my aid when I was brought before a sort of tribunal uh, <laughs> for asking at a workshop why, why the workshop leader was doing a psychological experiment on us. All I asked was, why are we doing this? And uh, someone you know, tattled on me, and I was dragged into the principal's office, and I had to get the union to defend me. So, you know, a lot of people don't understand, but I see that teachers are coming out now and speaking out against it, and some are even quitting their jobs because they don't like this globalism stuff. And you mentioned the organization that uh, deals with social studies. A while back, there was a great article in one of our education activist blogs that I also reblogged, and the people that were called in at this social studies conference for teachers for training were from the Council on Foreign Relations and the Federal Reserve. (laughs) And the lessons they were teaching the teachers about teaching were to justify their existence, you know, right. the Council on Foreign Relations with their war right. agenda and the Federal Reserve, because they know that public sentiment is mounting against the legality of the Federal Reserve. That's a whole other issue. Yes. And if your listeners are astute at anything else, they know that, you know, I, I don't just do education. I wear many other hats and that was one of the, the issues, as you know, um, in certain campaigns, <laughs> 2008, 2012, but it's catching on to the general public. But to think, if I had, I mean, it was outrageous enough, some of the, some of the training sessions I went to were outrageous enough, but if I had had to sit and listen to propaganda from the Federal Reserve and the Council on Foreign Relations, I really think I would have taken my coat and gone out the door, I would have stomped out. I mean, we had people telling us, and I, and I really truly sometimes wonder if they even knew what they were saying. Um, it, th- this phrase that I heard over and over again could be u- meant to be used in two different ways. She said something about, you do not want, we do not want any cultural transmission. Now, cultural transmission could mean you know, chit-chatting with children, which, of course, the way they structured the lessons, the kids could just tell each other the answers. Uh, or it could have meant cultural transmission, meaning the skills uh, based on individualism and that sort of thing, rather than changing the values, attitudes, and beliefs. So I truly believe it's the latter. They don't want cultural transmission of our old capitalistic, individualistic values. They want globalistic values, attitudes, and beliefs. So we were warned not to culturally transmit any of our ideas. Uh, And if you couldn't look up your teacher as a moral leader, then what? I mean, you might as well hire a high school student to walk around the room and just make sure the kids aren't killing each other because that's basically the way they want you to teach today. They want you to throw them in little groups and let them teach themselves and let them construct their own learning. I'm sure you've heard that word constructivism before. Um, And what could go wrong with that? You know, uh, you teach reading for meaning, but children are supposed to construct their own learning, uh, excuse me, their own meaning, I mean, what could go wrong? They could read a paragraph and it could be completely the opposite of what the paragraph intended to say, but because the child constructed his or her own meaning from the words, it is perfectly okay. And there you go with the two plus two is five philosophy. 
So um, that's something that I could not reckon with. And uh, it made it very difficult for me in my last years of teaching. And I think I probably might have taught for 40 years if I didn't have to deal with that. Well, Jane, tell me something. What are, isn't the solution to this thing as far as the corporations and the globalists, et cetera, are concerned, uh, the Teach for America teachers, that what they're doing, they're getting rid of all the good ones like you and bringing these Teach for America teachers in, not only from the Amer- United States, but they're bringing them in from foreign countries. And uh-huh. uh, could you could you touch on that a bit, how they're really just facilitators and uh, they're checking on the computer I'm to make exactly sure that the kids are... I'm not exactly familiar with Teach for exactly. America. Give, but give what us happened, something on that. Yeah, I'm not exactly familiar with that. The Sort of the opposite happened where I was. We had a lot of Cambodian refugees. And no one is more dedicated than these Cambodian women who came over from their war-torn country... They love this country. Um, they are highly educated. They are against communism. Yep. Um, the teacher who worked next door to me saw my house, and she said, be careful, the government will take it from you. Uh, <laughs> and she mentioned that the government had killed her father, who was 60 years old. Uh. And here I was thinking firing squad. So I asked her how it happened, and she said, oh, no, no, nothing like that. She said, they withheld medical care from him (laughs) so Ah, that's that's pretty scary when i look at that in retrospect now uh Uh, here i was thinking okay a war-torn country maybe he was a soldier maybe he was a dissident and they put him up against a wall and shot him no she said they just withheld medical care because he was 60 which ought to scare the bejeebus out of any of us (laughs) that are over 60 especially now with the obamacare um so I was getting little hints about communism from these folks, but these folks were hired. They were given dual certification. Their English wasn't perfect, but some of them were in charge of regular classrooms. And then suddenly there was a huge purge, and these poor people were put out on the street with no jobs oh. uh, because they couldn't pass perfectly the English proficiency. I think one or two of them did. Because we had a great number of students. I think 45% of the students were from Cambodia. So we did need teachers who could speak the language just to be able to handle these children at first until they became acclimated to uh, the language. But the sad part was whenever the teachers would have, you know, the kindergarten would have an Easter egg hunt for spring or something like that, they would be devastated to be told They couldn't do these very American things because they were holidays, and God forbid you couldn't celebrate Christmas, you couldn't celebrate Easter. So they were heartbroken because this is why they left the communist country. They came to America because they love our culture. And so I saw a lot of that, too. So that was a big irony. As far as the Teach for America, I'm not really familiar with that, but you could probably fill the listeners in on that. Well, I would like to just, you know, there's something very important that we have so much research and occasionally, you know, you start going back and looking at yourself in, in your own book, right? And I, for a long time, um, I this, this is in regard to uh, the deception out there in regard to school choice and charter schools being promoted by the, the uh so-called Republicans and conservatives mainly, and the corporations. And we all think in terms of their, their being the ones, and, and they're the ones that are bringing in the Teach for America uh, teachers that really don't have the same ba- academic background and experience that people like yourself have. But the other day, I've, I found a grant. Uh, it, it's uh, Alternatives in Education. It was a... Uh, it was on John Dewey letterhead. The, uh, the, it came to my office in the Department of Ed, and uh, the leading people involved were John Goodlad and Fantini and Ray Wood and Ralph Tyler. And uh, I, it was in regard to alternatives in education. And I did put this, this up at our new blog. You know, that's uh, 
I'm going to give it to people because they've got to go there. A lot of good research. It's, it's my new blog, and it's called ABCs, ABCs, right? ABCs, uh, OF of dumb down, one word, dot blog spot.com i hope everybody will go there we're getting it only went up two days ago we've got 400 hits already the abcs of dumbdown.blogspot.com now we put this up there it's it's dynamite and in effect it's not the conservatives that came up with the idea of school choice and charters at all this paper, this, they were calling for funding, uh, 1981, deals with the need for school choice and charter schools and effective schools. It's, a, it's dynamite. So, mm-hmm. in other words, the charter school and school choice agenda is coming from the left. The research is there. The documentation is there. How do you like it? On John Dewey Society letterhead, requesting money from my office in the Department of Ed to do this yeah. study mm-hmm. of the need for school choice and mm-hmm. charter schools. And Sizer, who you know, Professor oh, Sizer, deeply involved in this project. And effective schools, mastery learning, and everything that we have been told, we've been led to believe, came out of the conservatives. The conservatives bought onto it, didn't they? They bought Very in because so. if it had been known that it was the left that was pushing the school choice agenda, people really, homeschoolers wouldn't have liked that. All the people upset with the public schools now wouldn't like it. So uh, at the same time, I want to mention that the NEA at the top, because I have a document, Cardinal Principles of the NEA, 1976, a very interesting document uh, where the pre-planning committee for the uh, Cardinal Principles document, which was calling for all global ed, the top person there was David Rockefeller and McGeorge Bundy, mm. who a lot of our people know him. And so when Jane is talking about them coming in, the CFR and the Federal Reserve for in-service training, all of this fits together. So uh, that doesn't mean I'm not very upset with the the conservatives. I am very upset because they are no longer conservative. They are in bed with these very people, CFR, the left, uh, the Department of Education, Washington, D.C., the U.N. and all. And we this is they've got to be exposed. Uh, People just don't have this information. So I'm, I'm going to let you, you go with that one. But it is, go, go to the new blog, ABCs of dumbdown.blogspot.com. There's, there's information there that is getting out in little bits and pieces that parents and teachers and concerned people around the world can use proving what exactly what Jane's talking about today. Oh, ahead, I think Jane. more people are beginning to understand this about the charter schools. Um, the way I put it to them is I tell them as long as one cent of taxpayer money is going to fund these schools, they too are going to be under the same control, which the problem with the public schools is that now all the influence is being driven from the top down, from corporations, NGOs, foundations, I mean, we're having terrible trouble with the foundations here. They're just running the show. What mm-hmm. happened to the taxpayer? What happened for, to the bottom-up philosophy where the parents and taxpayers are supposed to control the school board? That's right. And this is what is being lost. And so I, too, blog for various radio shows, and um, I blog for the Bedford Patch, and I did write a piece about why, you know, do the leftists, who usually rant and rave against the 1% and the corporations, Mm -hmm. why do they go along with Common Core when it's being run by corporations and NGOs and foundations? Why are they siding with the so-called rich people that they supposedly decry all the time in their politics? Mm 
Exactly. It doesn't seem, it's a strange bedfellow, as they say. So I wrote a little piece about that because I think my forte is I take a small issue, I, I take an issue and take a small piece of it and spoon feed it to people so they can understand. I guess that's the teacher in me. And I ask these questions to get the wheels rolling in their head to look deeper into it and and to understand the deeper issues such as, you know, the some of the very involved and, um, you know, uh, very deep subjects that are in your book. Um, but this very basic question is something they should think about and should turn a light bulb on in their head. Why how are you they, left How can they access uh, the Bedford patch? Uh, tell people. Um, it's Bedford dash nh dot patch dot com and if you just go to patch dot com it's a network of blogs and interestingly enough at first I steered clear of it because I really I really thought it was it's a product of George Soros Huffington Post. However the local editors if they like you and they're conservative it's a very good outlet for posting your material. So I don't mind posting there. I was asked to write a column. And so if you look up Bedford, New Hampshire patch, my blog is on there and I've written about all kinds of subjects. Agenda 21. Uh, I wrote about a woman from the world bank who was promoting IB, uh, which I also helped stop in Bow, New Hampshire. I also stopped Dennis with Dennis Whitkey's small schools project in Rochester, which was similar to the Theodore Sizer right. um, schools, coalition of schools type thing. And, and if you know Dennis Litke, he had that failed Thayer Academy um, experiment where the kids were just wandering around <laughs> all day into the cities <laughs> and nothing was happening in the school. And now he's selling this stuff, this open schools type of thing. Um, I have a lot of uh, articles I've written on cnht.org about that. And if you want, you can post up or I can tell you the different uh, URLs for the different blogs, but it's. Yeah. I would like to have this, uh, Jane, because, you know, people listen and they, they don't get this stuff. Well, I mean, for instance, I didn't get it when you said CHL, what did you say? Uh, Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers. It's right. yeah, now, let, let, Let's take some time for you to get them out, okay? Okay. Well, I started off with the taxpayer group, and so a lot of my education writing is there because the taxpayer group would try to also, you know, have a say in what their school boards were doing. So I helped a couple of towns and cities to get rid of certain programs that they were going to be trying to push on them. So I did a lot of pieces and research writing. Coalition of New Hampshire Taxpayers, it's a statewide taxpayer group. It was the radio show that I was on with Ed Nail. Um, but the URL is very short. It's cnht.org. And if you go in their news section, that's the blog, and you can read about education issues. And if you look up Dennis Whitkey, uh, the big picture schools. That's the name of his company. He's a friend of William Ayers. Uh, yep. They're all connected. Theodore Sizer, you know, the whole bunch of them together. Uh, the other blog was the Bedford Patch, which that's easy to find if you just dial up patch.com, find the state, and then find the town of Bedford, and it will show you uh, Bedford, New Hampshire's uh, URL for there. And okay. on that, I have written about the Agenda 21, um, the schools, and those subjects. Uh, and then we have a new StopCommonCoreNH.org. Every state is coming out, it seems, with a Common Core blog, and we deal with Common Core and various other issues related to what's going on in our public schools in New Hampshire. That's StopCommonCoreNH.org. Uh, our most recent flap was this business with the father that was arrested. Yes. And I'm sure the Santelli listeners would be interested in this. The parent went to the school board to complain about the pornography that was being given in the honors English class. 
uh, in a book that he discovered, and he spoke a little bit more than the two-minute uh, rule, and they had the police come right in. It looked like it was all planned, uh, and they dragged him out in handcuffs. So, <laughs> this Unbelievable. Is in the United States of America. It's no. terrible. But I wrote a piece about that because I wanted people to get the more important message. I mean, yes, we know the kids can get all this sex anyplace else if they want. That's just thrown into the book because it just is. The point is that they are not using classical literature. They're using informational text, by the way, even things like EPA brochures, you know, to promote global warming and all of that. But these modern texts are being used because they are written with a point. And all the mainstream media articles had one sentence in there that should have turned on a light bulb for people. The school was defending the use of the book because they said it was chosen for other themes. Well, you betcha. They chose it because it had to do with a massive school shooting. Um, it was about gun control. You know, it was part of the political agenda and brainwashing that goes on in the schools today that they can't do if they use Shakespeare or classical literature, but they can do with these modern texts. It's called, the book was called 19 Minutes, Jody P. Colt, and on page 313, there's quite a graphic uh, description of one high school student raping another, and then she accepts it. And uh, it's very pornographic. And if, if a stranger approached your 13-year-old with this material on the street, they would be arrested. But the schools can get away with it because it's an informational text with a theme. With Absolutely shocking. That Absolutely <laughs> shocking. You know, Jane, I, I wish I could find this, but about 15 or maybe 10 years ago, I had an article out of uh, a newspaper in the UK, England, and mm -hmm. uh, it was so the, t the students in high school, they all got together and they were complaining about the horrible literature that they were being exposed to. And they're saying, look, please give us some good literature, you know, like uh, whatever, they're, they're marvelous. Even now there's good literature out there, but they were, they were upset. They were expressing their concerns, their, their aversion to this sort of dirty, stinky stuff, depressing, focused on death and dying and uh, et cetera. And uh, it made a big, it was in the Guardian, I believe, a uh, wonderful article. I wish I could find it because this parents have got to understand that I think we're all being brainwashed into thinking that the kids want this stuff. They don't. They no. naturally have an aversion to this. And maybe our, our focus should be on getting young people to speak out themselves. If people don't want to listen to us old, old fashioned people, you know, let them li hear the voices of the young. And well, uh, this fact, probably I'm would be a good project. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'm glad you brought this up about the children because we had a similar situation in Bedford. I mean, this happens all the time. We had a situation where a student went home and told his parents that he did not like the content of a book that he was being required to read. Now get this for a personal finance class. Oh. I think they were religious and it had something to do with mocking Jesus or some, something that was very irreverent. And, and I think there was also pornography, but here was the point. It was the child who brought it up. And when the parents went to the school board, it was very contentious. Uh, my friend, Anne Marie was there fighting for these parents as well. And once again, the book was inappropriate for the class because a personal finance class. Now, what would you think would be taught there? The kids should learn how to balance a checkbook, yeah. uh, how to make a budget and not spend too much, uh, how to apply for a bank account or apply for a loan or use a credit card. Just, you know, basic skills that are very, you know, uncontroversial. But this book, called Nickel and Dined, was written by a member of the Socialist Party. She wasn't a financial expert at all. She had gone across the country to see how the minimum wage affected people. And here again, there was an agenda behind it. 
the book was not about personal finance. It was about promoting the raising of the minimum wage. Now, regardless of what you think about raising the minimum wage, this book did not, it, it, it clearly had a political agenda. It was being used in a class where you thought kids were learning skills. And I actually had a nice little waitress tell me that she was waitressing because she'd been to Africa to fight AIDS and she'd done all this community organizing, but she wished to heck that in college they had taught her how to balance a checkbook because she had no practical skills to get a job. So out of the mouths of babes, it's starting to happen. The kids are starting to realize it because they are not getting jobs with some of the things that they're being taught. They're not being taught the skills they need. And yet you hear all this rhetoric about we need uh, to compete in the global economy. They use that all the time. Uh, we hear, you know, they need, um, need to be able to compete globally with other people because, you know, it's global now for the jobs and all of that. But meanwhile, they're doing everything to prevent the kids from actually competing and doing this. Because well, let's Joe, face uh, it, Jane, in order to Jane if you go back, there's something in Delivered Dumbing Down. If you look under J for Jordan, I think, this is uh -huh. way back in the, like, in the 70s. And this yes. was out of Georgia, and it was uh, it's a chart, and it was funded by partially funded by Exxon, I believe, and it's a chart that shows how they will diminish academics starting in kindergarten when the percentage of academics is like ninety percent, and then you mm -hmm. see you, you really very important this this proof of how the academics is diminished. By the time you get into, into middle school, you've got about 30% academics, high school oh, yeah. 10%, and the rest of it is what they call critical thinking, which is nothing but Marxism, you know that, and uh, yes. global ed and everything else. So that, that's the deliberate, the deliberate dumbing down. And uh, that's very important. Just look under, go free download, Deliberate Dumbing Down. It's at my website. It's free. And click on Lucille Jordan, and you'll see that. Now, at the same time, what was, what's was what been going on is the young people, as you just said, they don't like, that's why they're bored, they're getting in trouble and all. They, they, they detest, they sense it, because they, they're closer to it than we are. They don't like what they're getting. And they're resisting it. Now, when I was on the local board in 1978 in Camden, I tried to get grammar back. They took grammar out. And so I just wanted five minutes of grammar. I finally got that. But in the five minutes, right, a day. But in the process, students came in with their parents. And one teacher even had the guts to come in to plead with the school board to bring back, war, is it Warner's grammar? Yes, I think that's what it is. Uh, and they said, look, you used to have this in the bookcase here for the kids, where is this? And the children were themselves, the students were asking for grammar. Mm. So, Well, we had to throw away all those books. You know, that was the great purge. And instead they infused the library with uh, sex books and things that disturbed my first graders, I can tell you that. But here's what I think the whole issue is. I think that the global elite know that there are always going to be children who don't learn as well as others. And I think they feel that why bother teaching everyone to become middle class? It's right. unsustainable. They don't want us to have our air conditioning and, you know, <laughs> drive our cars and live right. in the suburbs. That's part of Agenda 21. I think they understand that the cream will rise to the top anyway, right. and those people will be recruited to be the leaders, and right. that the rest of the masses are going to be taken care of with the redistributive society. Everything's going to be given to them by government and, of course, given as well as taken away, um, if not eventually this level of society eradicated. So I think they just feel that they will get people, uh, you know, situated, uh, uh, oriented towards this managed society of the future, and those who make it on their own will, and they will be the ones to rule, and the ones who don't 
will just be taken care of. And it's sort of like well, a know, caste system by design. This, this, John, uh, Jane, uh, we're unfortunately, I wish we had, we do have more time if you can continue on a bit, but uh, what you're talking about is uh, the original plan. It's in my book, the, uh, you know, Rockefeller's associate or aid Gates way back in the early part of the century talking about, uh, you know, they don't, we don't need a lot of doctors, lawyers, professors, uh, artists, musicians, et cetera, and we'll just keep them down on the farm. Well, you know what? Uh, we've been through the whole integration movement, which I totally supported. We've been through all of this and all we see, and now it's becoming very obvious with, I believe that the Broad Foundation, or I read something yesterday and it's on the blog, my dumb down blog, uh, for people to go and take a look at that, where uh, they're touting the wonderful results in the charter schools in the inner cities and their results are drawn from equally dem equal demographic, low income uh, minority school areas that one against the other. So one in, uh, inner city school that has a charter school that got the award uh, is being compared with another inner city school. Now, this is uh, comparing apples against apples instead mm -hmm. of expecting the inner city schools to, to measure up to uh, an affluent school in Connecticut or somewhere, uh, they're not making that comparison. And this, this goes exactly with what you're talking about. Have they given up on their original, what they told us, which was a big lie, I believe, that they really cared about the inner city kids? Because if you look, they have experimented on those very children with the no grades and everything else for a good 40 years now, and they've mm -hmm. gone down the tubes, and uh, that's in order to put this new system in with no grades, no competition, uh, collectivist, you know, school to work. That's what they've, they've used those minorities. And now the Broad Foundation, I believe that's what it was, I hope I'm right, uh, came out with a press release that uh, they're not comparing the charter school that got the, the award with with an affluent, academically oriented, successful school, they're not making that comparison. They're comp they're comparing with a school in the same demographic uh, area. Uh, you know, uh, low income minorities. Now, what kind of a award should they be giving there? I mean, is this what charter schools are all about? You were just talking about. The division in our society where the elite are going to be the cream up top and the rest, as in the Rockefeller paper of the early 1900s, will be working down on the farm or whatever else. Well, what a, this is shocking. Multi-trillions of dollars have gone into uh, lying to the American people and into education to do just the opposite of what they told us they were doing. Well, that's true. What it's, do you think about the charter school thing? Uh, you, you tell us what is, you think about it. It is very deceptive, and uh, we are coming up against the top of the hour, the end of the hour, and I would just like to say for those of you listening from New Hampshire or anywhere, we're starting to see these foundations coming in to provide for after-school or push for after-school programs. They want the children before and after, and they want them younger and younger. Uh, we had the Annenberg Institute come to New Hampshire, and you know that's where William Ayers worked. Uh, they actually use PR firms, just the same ones as they use to push the Agenda 21 from the federal government. They're using PR firms and actors to conduct these phony listening sessions. And we had the person from the Annenberg Institute come to a rural area like Pittsfield and teach the teachers that they had to teach for social justice. So what they're doing is they're not only teaching uh, so that the masses that don't learn will still will fall by the wayside, but they're also teaching them to demand more and more from the government. So they're working from both ends here. And I have written about that on both the Patch and the Common Core blogs. And you can read about all of that. And that's 
uh, that's the problem in New Hampshire, and we have been doing our best to alert people. Uh, it's amazing the governor set up this uh, transparency commission. All a smokescreen because who is she using to check on transparency? The very same people we complain about the the foundations and their listening uh, group, their PR group, are going to run these sessions, and I'm I'm hoping everybody will go to them on the third. You know, it's more Delphi stuff, and they're going to well, be uh, critiquing themselves basically, and it's a big joke. Hey. Oh, Jane, that no, is well, we're, we're really about to, to run out. I, I've just got one thing I've got to say, which has to do with all this. People have got to uh, check on the reauthorization of Elementary and Secondary Education Act about to go in, which deals with what Jones, uh, Jane's talking about, what they're going to be doing, This lower, the lower class, so-called, that they consider, I don't consider that, will have all the services under the umbrella of the school district lifelong and this is going in the umbrella and that's called for in the reauthorization of the elementary and secondary education act lifelong under the umbrella of the school district all services and that will be what what the people who've not received a real education and uh the the, the huge percentage we're talking about that the charter schools are are, are lauding the fact that their results are good and they're not so go to ESEA reauthorization and also the blog, uh, my dumbing down blog, because there's good information on that. Uh, Jay, I wish you could stay with us longer. This is so good. And anyway, um, I guess we're going to say goodbye to Jane. And uh, I want to get you back on again, Jane. And I'm sorry I had to cut you off, but there's always the end to everything. Let's hope there's an end to the destruction of public education and the rest restoration of it, uh, get it once we get rid of the U.S. Department of Ed, bring it back to the local level, let our good teachers teach again. Thank you so well, much. We will do this again sometime. Remember, they're keeping dossiers on your children just like they are in communist China, and that says a lot. Exactly, and that is, unfortunately, the model. Yes, it is. Well, thank you for having me, Charlotte. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And well, I want to thank you for all you've done, and thank Pete too for letting me have the show. Absolutely, uh, it's thank the best you. thing that ever happened that we can get this kind of information out. Now we've got Dave Brubeck, our favorite, huh? <laughs> yeah, great music too. Thanks a lot, Char. Bye, everybody.